David, today we turn to uh, chapter 11 of uh, 1 Corinthians, where uh, Paul is talking about um, stuff that's going on in the, the worship experience of this community. He had given some hints about yeah. worship in the last uh, 10, chapter, yeah. uh, but now he turns to it directly. And there seem to be two major issues. One has to do with um, the way the women folk in this community are behaving, right. and the other has to do with something about the way in which the, um, uh, the meal is being yeah. served. Um, first of all, what's going on with the women? Well, this is Bartlett's best guess, which is based on reading lots of other people who made their best guesses. There's some concern with the head covering of women in church, and people aren't quite sure whether it means that they are wearing some kind of headwear, headgear, or whether it's simply the fact that instead of having their head decorously looped, this is, here's where my entire total lack of fashion sense will immediately show itself. I have no idea what you call this. Mm -hmm. Um, having a kind of nice top knot curly thing on the top of their heads, they're letting the, the hair flow loose. In either case, Paul, for reasons that are hard for us to, to fathom, I think, thinks that it's totally inappropriate for women to lead in worship, to join in worship, uh, with that kind of uh, free-flowing hair, let's say. Now, now you mentioned that women are leading in worship. Yeah. I think that's an important point. Why, why do you say that? Well, because it seems to me that, the, that the question is not just when they pray privately, but when they pray as part of the part of the community mm -hmm. of faith in a kind of, and we'll see in chapter 14, that the people take turns doing that kind of thing. It seems to me that this represents a kind of leadership role, not simply a kind of private prayer role. Right, the fact that uh, he says praise or prophesies, and he yeah. uses prophecy Prophesy is, is a public in chapter phenomenon. 14, almost a, as the equivalent of a preaching. preaching. So right. they're doing, they're taking some kind of leadership role. That's not unimportant. It's not unimportant in saying, he, and we'll come back to this in chapter 14, at this point he's not saying women be quiet in church. Mm -hmm. He's saying women, when you take leadership roles in church, don't let your, literally don't let your hair down. Is it perhaps because they might be looking a little like worshipers of Dionysus? Yeah, say a little bit about that. I think that could well be well, true, especially in this kind of pagan so-called context. Yeah. There's a tradition in uh, Greek culture of uh, the worship of the god Dionysus, yeah. who was the god of wine and the god of the, the power in the vine. Yeah. Um, and at least uh, once a year, um, uh, and we know that this was going on even to Paul's day, uh, not far from Corinth, there'd be festivals at which uh, women would uh, engage in ecstatic dance. And we have uh, pictures of, the, of uh, this kind of dance from antiquity. Um, and the people who were engaging in it were called maenads. Yeah. And so Paul might be thinking that there's a boundary issue here, rather like the uh, idolatry uh, yeah. issue that he was raising in the previous yeah. chapter. And he's certainly concerned here and will continually be concerned about appropriate visitations of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That what does the Spirit do when it comes? And it's, as, is every, as it is in every case, it is not the case with spiritual life in church that anything goes either. Mm -hmm. that there are limits upon this, and this looks a little bit free-floating to him. There's, there's a kind of hierarchical thing that, that appears in this, and I think we need to take that head on for a moment. Uh, beginning with verse 7, a man not ought, ought not to have his head veiled, since he, and the he counts here, is the image and reflection of God. Um, but the woman is the reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is interesting because back in chapter 7, we didn't have a chance to talk about the issues of marriage, where it was very clear that this, this, Im the importance of not refraining from sexual intercourse within marriage had to do with the rights of both partners. There was no sense. There was mutuality. There was right. total mutuality in that. Uh, mutuality seems to diminish here somehow. There, there's mm -hmm. not, if not a hierarchy, there's a kind of clear distinction about mm -hmm. where, where people stand. What do you think? Paul, Paul does correct that, though. Okay. I, I think he, he has the sense, yeah, that this is an argument. And yeah, he's maybe reaching going for a far. number of different arguments yeah. uh, to, to get people to behave as he yeah. wants them to behave. But in verse 11, nevertheless, in, in the Lord, woman is not independent uh, of man nice. or man yeah. independent of woman. Yeah. So he wants to uh, get back to that, uh, that sense of, uh, of the sense in Christ. Yeah. Old distinctions have been uh, obliterated, uh, a principle he articulated in Galatians. Yeah. Uh, on one of his best days. Uh, one of, well, yeah. <laughs> neither slave nor free, right. nor male nor female, right. Jew nor Greek. Yeah. Uh, so I think he's, he's convinced of that fundamentally, although he'll use these it, it comes Well, and, and you're right, and, he, and the punchline of all this is, as woman came from man, man comes through woman. Mm -hmm. That's kind of equality. But most important, all, all things, things come from God. From God. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a kind of hermeneutical principle, interpretive principle that I'm not proud of, but it's on a tough day, take the best of Paul mm -hmm. and interpret the rest in the light of that. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll That's talk another day about principle. how we decide what the best of Paul is, but Galatians 3.28 mm -hmm. um, is certainly at the heart of all that.
Now, at one point here, there's a very difficult uh, verse, yeah. uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 10. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority yeah. on her head because of the angels. Yeah. What's going on there? Well, the only, uh, it's, a, it's a huge puzzle, like so many of these things. The only thing I can think of is the, is the business back in Genesis where the sons of God look down on women from on high and lusting after them come down and engage in inappropriate intercourse. Is there some sense that, that the woman who lets her hair loose is a loose woman? and therefore is tempting to those angels who might, I, I don't know, because we've just said the angels neither marry nor are given in marriage, so maybe they slip loose once in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't, what do you think? It's a toughie. Well, something like that yeah. may be going on. Uh, it's interesting that the term that's translated here, a symbol of authority, yeah. that's exactly what, uh, what the, the word should mean. It's exousia right. in Greek. Right. It, often translated in the past as a veil or something. Yeah. It can't be that. So um, I think what Paul is saying is if you're uh, exercising leadership in Christian worship, uh, be attentive to the situation in which you find yourself, yeah. which is one in which you're in touch with heaven. Yeah. Uh, he goes back to Isaiah, where uh, the prophet uh, hears the angels uh, yeah. uh, singing the Trisagion, yeah. the holy, yeah. holy, holy. Yeah. And he thinks that that's what happens in Christian worship. You're participating in that uh, divine Along realm. with the angels. And so, right, if you're, uh, if you're there, you have to uh, have some sort of mark of authorization yeah. to do so. Yeah, 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 okay. And that yeah. obtains. So, so decorum is not only for the body, but for the communion of, Something like that, of heaven right. and earth. Right. Brought together. It's a mysterious little passage. But it is a mysterious end, little passage. At the end of the day, he says, uh, finally, this is just not the custom. Oh, yeah. I do love that. It's like with your child. Because I said so. You know, <laughs> finally, I've given you 16 arguments why you're not supposed to do this. P.S. I said so. That, that's this about is, this it. Is, we don't do this as Christians, so just stop it. So what about the Lord's Supper and what's going on with that? Well, this is, this is an interesting one, and I've been helped by, by people who've tried to understand the sociology of the Corinthian church, and like all of us, they're guessing. But the issue seems to be that some people are coming earlier than others to the meal and are eating and drinking heartily, and then other folk come later and don't have anything to eat and simply participate in the kind of uh, bread and cup uh, liturgical part of the evening. And people have argued, I think, persuasively that, that those who come with better food and better drink and maybe those who can get off from work early are not the hardworking slaves and lower classes but the leisure classes, and what you have, the division within the church is not only a theological division, but at this point it's a kind of social division, that the wealthy are able to have a long and leisurely meal together, uh, that the less wealthy come in later, and so in an odd way the, the body of Christ is inappropriately broken just before the body of Christ is appropriately broken, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. one's a good thing and the other's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So how does Paul counter that? So Paul counters that by, uh, first of all, reminding them of what the, what the meaning of the text of the story was. And this is another place where he goes back to Jesus, uh, one of the few places where he goes back and says, here's the tradition about Jesus. And, and what we celebrate here is not a feast, uh, not simply a good time, not Wednesday night potluck at Old First Baptist, uh, but this is a commemoration of the death of Jesus for the sake of Jesus' people. And in that sense, uh, we're to enter into it reverently and also, I think, with attention to each other. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that Paul almost has a magical notion of what's going on in this? Um, this well, universe? what's interesting is at the very end he talks of this chapter, he talks about the fact that because some of the Corinthians have been participating unworthily, that they are going sick and dying. I defy any contemporary priest or pastor to get up and say, well, there have been a lot of funerals in the last two or three weeks. I bet it's because we've been doing the Eucharist wrong. Mm -hmm. um, is magical the right world, word? I don't know. In a way, it goes back to what we've been saying, that faith is embodied for him. And so we always think that spiritual mistakes have to have spiritual consequences. And those are our distinctions. I think his distinctions are mistakes have consequences. And uh, our distinction between bodily consequences and, and spiritual ones, we think of as a magic thing. I think he may just think mm -hmm. that's the way God's world goes. All right, I think that's right. Uh, and surely that category of magic is probably a little anachronistic. That's, that's our, yeah. that's our yeah. way of looking yeah. at it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see the, um, the very concrete advice he gives at the end of all of this, right? I'm in, about to in see what it is. Chapter 11, verse 33, uh, when you come together to eat, oh, wait absolutely. for one another. Absolutely. This points to, uh, this supports your reading of what the particular issue exactly. is. Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and you do, do it for the glory of God. Don't give any offense to other people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, once again, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Well, what are they imitating at this point? They're imitating their willingness to consider the other more lovingly than they simply consider themselves. It goes back to the kind of apostle he is, to the things he's willing to give up. Um, the, the one other piece that strikes me, and this will lead us to 
places we've been before, uh, is that when he recalls Jesus' words after, I think after he's quoted the words, he says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death mm -hmm. until he comes. And I've got two puzzles on that when I want to put out for you. Um, more in terms of what's yet to happen as opposed to what has happened. We proclaim the Lord's death, and I think there's some suspicion that when they get together to have this really big gourmet meal before the others get there, they're thinking about resurrection celebrations, heavenly feasts. Mm -hmm. If the angels are there, let's eat angelic food and have a great time. If this is still about Christ's death, it's still about sacrifice for each other, not just enjoying a meal. And the until he comes, that, that we are not yet fully in that heavenly kingdom. One day there'll be a banquet. At that banquet, the poor and the rich will all come together, but we're not there yet. In the meantime, uh, while we wait for him, we think about one another. Mm -hmm. So it brings together those two things so that we've seen operating from the beginning yeah. of this letter, the focus on the cross as the central uh, hallmark of Christian belief and practice. Yeah. You, 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 that's the, the, the test. It's huge. You, yeah. you have to have some relationship to the cross. Exactly, or it's not Christian. Christian. And you also have to have some sort of sense of where it's all going, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that this is leading to. Uh, it is leading to that, but it's not there yet. We're, mm -hmm. still, we're still waiting for the fullness of that coming. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece where he talks about eating and drinking without discerning the body, and lots of people have suspected that the body that's being discerned is not, this is not Catholic, Protestant, Lutheran, Presbyterian argument about what happens to the bread and cup. That's a later discussion. It's an argument about discerning the body in the communion around you. So that if you and I get there early and have enjoyed our gourmet meal, while the slave people and the freed persons who've been working at our houses come in late and have nothing to eat, that's where we're not discerning the body. We're not discerning this larger body of Christ, which is where we're about to go in chapter 12 because we're not discerning our brothers and sisters. We're not caring for them. Right. This is the same sort of thing we saw before about temple. Temple yeah, language exactly. refers to the, exactly. the whole as well as to the individual. Exactly. And here, body language refers to the, the social unit as I well as so. the, I think uh, so. I think so. The Eucharistic. Yeah, I don't think we're yet at disputes about right. what happens when the words are mm -hmm. spoken. Mm -hmm. it's, a so. great, it's a great text because it does what, what the communion text is a great text because it does what I think Paul does best, which is to say two things, that our liturgical life reflects our is reflected in our, forms our theology. Theology is not just sitting and thinking. Theology is thinking about what we do when we come to a table. And on the other hand, our theology informs our liturgical practice. It's not just what we do, it's how we understand what we do. That, that's this text. All right. <laughs>